Welcome to Housing Matters, the Vancouver Real Estate Show. I'm Stuart McNish. I'm your host, and this is episode three. Today, we're talking about rental, rental, and rental. Our guests are Hanny Lamam from Cressy Developments, Vancouver City Councillor Gene Swanson, and Tom Davidoff, a professor at the Sauter School of Business out at UBC. Now, let's get to the show. Hanny Lamam from Cressy Development, thank you for joining me. We're talking about rental housing today. Uh, and there definitely is a push that we need to increase the rental housing supply because by all accounts, we're at a little less than 1% uh, uh, as far as a, um, you know, a, a vacancy rate, which makes it difficult for people who are looking for rental homes. The problem is, what is the most effective way that we go about increasing that supply? The, we're hearing so much about let's tax, 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 tax to beat the market into place and somehow create a pool of funding that's going to create this. Uh, well, I can't. I, I could do it no justice to explain what the thinking is behind that. That, of course, isn't your view. From your perspective, what what do we need to do to be able to incre increase the rental supply? Well, the the fundamental thing they have to start with is that in order to build rental housing, we need capital. And capital demands a return. And if we disincent capital and we take away the opportunity for a return and we take away the opportunity for, for prosperity for landlords, then they're not going to be motivated to invest in rental housing in this province. And regret regrettably, the actions that have been taken so far are taking a sticks approach to, to protecting rental housing as opposed to a carried approach to incentivize the construction of rental housing. Um, all the measures to date have done nothing to encourage a landowner to take the risk, because these are very risky projects um, that take uh, many years, you know, our last, we have a current rental project under construction right now that we have been five years in approval on. Five years in approval five, to build rental. Five years rental. in approval, yes. Um, and so when you consider the timeline, we, it, it is hard for us to speculate as to, you know, what demand is going to be five years from now. In fact, it's going to be another two years before we finish construction. Um, that that this risk is, is, is significant, and yet there is little recognition that that capital who takes that risk deserves a return. Uh, so the, the measures that have been taken to date uh, only attempt to restrict that potential for return. So then what is the motivation for a company like yours to build rental housing? You say you're doing some now, but where's your level of interest in developing that next project that we know is needed? Really, the, I mean, the only answer I have is we're actually well-intentioned developers. You know, we are in this market. This is where we live. This is where we have uh, um, chosen to do business. We are significant landlords already in, uh, in this region, and we want to continue to build our portfolio. Um, but we also have options and alternatives. Um, you know, we can, as is well known, we can build condominium product, and profit significantly from that. Or we can choose to take a long-term approach and build rental housing and take um, uh, you know, that meager return that we get in our investment over 30 years. So Tom Davidoff, he's going to be in this same episode. He said, you know, we actually have a pretty good pool of supply of uh, units that could go to rental. They've just been built as condos, and the impetus to rent them out goes to the owner, the current owner of the condo. Is he right about that? For sure. I mean, a lot of a lot of the condo product that we and our industry peers have built is in the rental in the rental pool. Um, but you know, we, you know, by restricting, uh, say, rent increases, as was done recently, as late as September last year. Um, the province takes away that motivation for return because investors look for a return. So if they can't get that return, if they can't keep up with the costs uh, and stay ahead of the costs, when we think that, when we see that property taxes are going up in the range of 5%, when we see, see utility fees going up in the range of 6, 10 to 12% uh, in various municipalities, 
Well, the, the consequence is unless you have turnover in tenants, your, your cash flow from your investment is actually shrinking. And the net effect of that is that your asset is depreciating. So it becomes a bad business decision to mm -hmm. own rental. Well, Gene Swanson is another guest that's going to be on the same uh, uh, cast that you're on. And she said, well, even though you're going to have a turnover of uh, a tenant, she believes that the rent should be locked in post a change in tenancy. So what does that do to you to, to, to motivate you to say, okay, I want to get into that market? Well, there's, I mean, I'll, I'll cite a recent example, and this was brought up by the city of New Westminster. The, the city of New Westminster is very disappointed that this one little uh, apartment building comprised of 14 units and was stratified, uh, was the, the landlord in that case decided to pull it out of the rental pool and sell the individual units to individual owners. Um, so now we've lost 14 units of rental. But why did they do? Why did the landlord elect to do that? It's because they were looking at this new rent cap. They were looking at uh, you know the rental housing task force uh, coming forward with you know unknown recommendations at the time. So they decided to take a shrewd business approach and sell the units. So we lost rental product as a result, and so this all comes back and all I can say is that short-sighted policy um, is driving landlords to make decisions that are not in the best interest of the renting public. You've taken a look at what they've done in Seattle. Have they got a good formula or one that we should be taking a close look at and considering adopting here? And, you know, you can't just say I'm going to take Seattle and uh, apply it to the entire lower mainland, but is, is, should jurisdictions be looking at that? Well, what did Seattle do? Seattle brought in uh, policies that said, okay, if you build new rental housing, if you agree that 20% of that rental housing is going to be rented out at below market rates tied to income, um, then we will give you a property tax holiday for 10 years. The consequence is that they got a flood of new rental housing built. More in the last four or five years than in the last 50 years. Exactly. Uh, the result is high vacancies. Well, you know, landlords are business people. If they need to fill those vacancies. What are they going to do? Right? They lower rents. They introduce incentives. They get the units filled out. That is a market um, reaction and a market solution to a problem. Um, when our government decides that no, as opposed to letting the market um, drive rents, we are going to um, mandate it, mandate it, and yep. restrict it. And and what that does is it scares away investors. It scares away capital. There's a reason why we haven't seen rental housing built. The demand is there. So. So good business people will find a way to build it mm -hmm. if, the, if the environment is hospitable, is welcoming of that investment. And what we've done is said, we've effectively said we don't want it because we think we know better. And by um, us looking after the renter at, at the uh, cost of the landlord, we've chased away any potential new landlords, we have no, we have very little institutional capital invested in rental housing in this province. Most of the rental housing is owned by private investors, not institutions. You go anywhere else in the world and it's pension funds, insurance companies, uh, REITs, that's who owns apartment buildings. Here, it's all private. And yet the response to those uh, owners is, well, you don't deserve to have a rate of return on that property because your responsibility is to be giving back to society. And in a utopian world, I think that's a nice idea, but I don't know how you attract people to invest. And I say that because I was talking to uh, someone who invests in a wide variety of different properties in North America, zero in Vancouver. And for that reason, and so is, is the... Uh, yes, we were wanting to create uh, below market housing. We're wanting to create uh, a, an excess in supply so that we can bring down rates. But it's as though we're doing everything possible to drive away the investment that will make that happen. Correct. I totally agreed. I don't know how else I can, what else I can add. That's an unfortunate situation for us to be in. 
Yes. I was hoping that you were going to come in and say, here, I've got a magic wand and let me show you how, how to do this. But it's, it's too multifaceted, isn't it? Well, it is. And, it, and it's, and it's, and it's, you know, and the challenge is that uh, we need multiple levels of government to work together. We need municipal governments to collaborate with land, developer landlords. Um, there are, a, you know, a, a good strong group of developers in this city who are also significant landlords. Um, if we work together with government, we can bring a large volume of rental product. It can be affordable and it can be market. And it's the combination of both that, that will see a large amount of new housing built. Those are not the voices that we're hearing these days. And do you find it difficult to get uh, people in various different city halls to listen to you? Absolutely. Um, you know, we tend to be quite successful when we speak to staff um, because we have we can we can get an audience with staff at City Hall. Uh, we don't have the same access to the politicians who uh, invariably make uh, will invoke policies and, and uh, zoning. Um, but and those and those politicians are, are reacting to the people that elect them. And when we go to council's chambers, we are um, we are faced with typically a large group of uh, tenants and tenant advocacy groups who come out and uh, don't necessarily make rational arguments. So the you know so the council. Is there and has to respond, and uh, in many cases they make poor decisions. Well, in coming shows, we're going to invite some of those city planners and politicians in to be guests on the show to talk about these very issues. Thanks for coming in and giving us your perspective, and let's hope that we can maybe uh, shift the point of view here just a little bit. That would be great. Thanks very much. Thanks. <laughs> Joining me now is Councillor Vancouver City Councillor Jean Swanson. Jean, welcome. Thank you. Rental housing in Vancouver and in the greater, you know, Metro Vancouver area is a big issue. As a matter of fact, it's uh, highly important to you. Why is it so much the focus of your term in office and when you also ran to, uh, to be elected or re-elected? So over half the people in Vancouver are now renters? Half, 50%. Over half, yeah, 51 or 2 or 3, something like that. And uh, the rents are way too high for the average renter. And a lot of people are being renovated. And there's no place for them to go. So they're having to leave the city. They're having to double up, triple up, quadruple up. Yeah. So what has led to this? Because, you know, and you go back to the 70s and 80s, uh, there were incentives to build rental housing, and we had... Uh, a pretty good supply. Now, I cut you off. You were going to say you something. Did. Yeah. <laughs> Another huge problem around renting is that we have a lot of homeless people, and one of the reasons that we have that is because um, welfare and disability rates are too low to both pay rents and eat mm -hmm. unless you get into social housing. True. But renting is something that affects all sectors of, of society. Uh, not the, just the, the lowest income, the worst, moving up the ladder. Well, we're in a situation, I mean, we talk about affordability in the city of Vancouver. Uh, we're reaching a point where there's an awful lot of working poor or people who are at the early stages of their career, and they're having trouble finding rental housing that, uh, that they can, uh, can afford. And as a result, there's a lot of people who are now starting to say, maybe Vancouver's not the place for me. And does that not put us at risk as a city? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, we just dealt with a rezoning up at City Hall, um, where a new a developer is going to put in a new project with 34 rental units, and he's going to get a city subsidy of about half a million dollars in development cost levy waivers, but seven or eight units are going to have to be demolished, and they're paying really good rents, like 650 to 850. So where are those people going to go? There's no protection for them yet. Okay. So, and is that not the trick, though? How do we balance off the greater need against those of some people who wind up finding themselves in, in, in a challenging situation when the renovation takes place and they lose their accommodation? Well, the problem is that the new units are going to be really expensive. Mm -hmm. Like the bachelors are going to be almost 1500 a month, and the average uh, person 
renter in that area can only afford 600 a month. So then what would you have proposed that would have been done differently? So I'm thinking that um, we desperately need uh, more renter protection, like uh, rules like vacancy control where landlords can't raise the rents as much as they want when a tenant leaves. But we also need a source of revenue to build lots of non-market housing. But isn't there already a commitment from the city of Vancouver to do that? Not enough. Okay, but how much is too much? I, you know, I find that there's this rub here because, you know, you need to have people who are going to invest in doing this. Uh, they can't do it for free. Um, people who are investing their own money don't do it just out of a sense of benevolence. So how do we find that right mix? Because there are a lot of people who do build rental housing, but they, and they do it with a long-term view, 50, 60 years out, that this is going to be rental housing, it's going to be in the market. But you can't do it if you're not covering your costs. Why would anybody do it? Well, that's one of the reasons why we need non-market housing, because the private sector developers can't or won't build housing that the vast majority of renters can afford. But is that not the larger portion of the population that needs rental housing anyways, the, the people who are working, who need... Uh, okay, well, uh, take know. this uh, building that was rezoned. Yes. Um, a, a studio, which was a very small studio, was renting for 1500 a month. To, so f to, in order for 1500 to be 30% of your income, which is the normally accepted percentage that rent should be, you'd have to be making 60000 a year mm -hmm. for a single person. The single person. So the rents that are coming in in these new buildings are way, way too high for the average renters in the various neighborhoods. So we desperately need a source of revenue, and that's why we proposed in our campaign a mansion tax which would be an extra tax on homes worth over $5 million and over $10 million, a little bit. It was a progressive property tax, right, just like we have a progressive income tax, so that we could get a couple hundred million a year and use that to first try our best to build enough modular housing, permanent modular housing, to end homelessness, and then start building social housing for renters, like our governments used to do, back in the 70s, when there were 30,000 units of social housing built across Canada. But what was the source of the revenue from that? Was that not tax incentives that came from the federal and no, provincial governments? No, not government? for social housing. That wasn't tax incentives. That was, ta that was tax money spent on social housing, which we still have today. But where was the tax money coming from? Was it targeting higher-end homes back then? Because that it seems to be the focus It wasn't a property tax back then. I think it was, it was more of an income tax which I would be cool on income tax, inheritance tax. If you tax the upper levels, I'm fine with that. Leave the middle levels and the lower levels alone. Get the money somehow. One way, that we propose the mansion tax because it's a city election. The city has jurisdiction over property tax. And why, why don't we have a progressive property tax just like we have progressive income tax? You're familiar with the Seattle solution because they had a period where for 40 or 50 years there was very little new rental housing that was built. Then all of a sudden they made, because they have that ability at the city uh, level to change the process by which the whole development process goes through. They can handle and, and change the uh, development fees and taxes and so on. And there has now been a, a boom in building of rental properties in Seattle to the point where rents are coming down, not just for the disenfranchised, but for everyone. There's incentives that are being offered by uh, landlords because they're saying, well, now I have a, a greater vacancy rate, unlike the less than 1% that we have here in Vancouver. So I've read a couple studies about that, and they show that the rents on the upper echelons are coming down, but the lower rents aren't coming down. The rents for lower income people aren't coming down. The rents for middle income people aren't coming down. The only rents that are coming down are the rents where the supply is being made, which is for the luxury the luxury place. Well, you take a look at a city like Seattle. Uh, they've got some pretty high incomes there. Um, and now we also see, so let's also talk about what Microsoft has done because they've started to say, well, we want to get involved in the housing market. Should we be looking at companies uh, that are here in Vancouver that are major employers and say, look, at you have a responsibility here too because you're bringing people in here to work. You help to create more affordable housing. I I would have no problem with that, giving them a big fat tax. You know, in Seattle, they tried to 
put an extra tax on employers to end to reduce homelessness to build housing for homelessness, but the it didn't work. The employers <laughs> spent tens of thousands of dollars lobbying to fight the tax, and they won. But I thought it was I can't. It, it really bugs me that the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, is refusing to pay a pilly little tax that would help end homelessness. I think it's really gross. <laughs> so what exactly is the solution? Do you think it is just that we tax those people and we create this fund that, that uh, creates housing for those who are uh, at the lower you, end of the, know, of, of the economic scale? There's a lot of people uh, nowadays, younger people, who don't know who have never seen a city that didn't have homeless people all over the place. I have. I'm 75. So I know that we don't have to have homelessness. And there's a couple of things that you have to do. One is welfare rates have to be high enough to pay rent, welfare and disability, and pension. And two, governments have to build nice, affordable housing, social housing, non-market housing. I live in nice market housing. I've lived in a nice co-op for 30 years. It's, it's financially stable. It's a wonderful community. It's nice housing. It's... We don't rent evict people. It's great. And that I think we need to start shifting so that we get a, a way higher percentage of housing to be non-market housing. And then if we do that, people who say, oh, I have to have a house so that I can live on my pension won't have to say that because they have a nice, affordable social housing, and they can live on their pension if they're not paying amazing, uh, astounding rents. Mm -hmm. So... The housing that you're in is going to be in that middle area of the rental housing market. Would that be a correct statement? Well, actually, uh, the rents are pretty low in my apartment. In That's my because place. you've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. you, you get the benefit of uh, having been a long, reliable uh, tenant. Um, and but so, my landlord well, isn't trying to rent evict me so he can get more rents, which is happening in a lot of old apartment buildings that are privately owned. So, and you say the the solution or the our, the way in which we're going to get more of the kind of housing that you call home is if we have the support of government and taxes that are going to support the development of that kind of housing. Yeah, we need taxes to build non-market housing, just like we used to have in the thirty in the seventies. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when thousands of units of non-market housing were built. Well, thank you very much for coming in and sharing that with us. We'll be back shortly with Tom Davidoff with his perspective on how we increase the rental supply here in the greater Vancouver area. Joining me now is Tom Davidoff. You're a professor at uh, the Sauter School of Business out at UBC. Uh, you, of course, are a well-known commentator on matters real estate. Today we're talking about uh, how to supply or increase the supply of rental housing because we've got a problem here uh, in the greater Vancouver area, less than 1%. What can we do to help to stimulate the uh, introduction or create new supply? Well, I think we have very likely. You know, a lot of what's gotten built is condo, and that is because... I think rental investors just haven't been willing to take the very bad, what we'll call cap rates, ratios of rent to price that individual investors in condos, be they owner-occupiers, Airbnb hosts, pied-a-terre vacation owners, or landlord investors have been willing to tolerate very low ratios of rent to price. And so we get a lot of condo buildings rather than purpose-built rental buildings. For the government to get a building to convert from a flexible tenure form, condo, where the owner can do what they want, to purpose-built rental takes uh, serious government intervention. On the other hand, preventing people from building condos takes serious government intervention because the market is desperate to supply these condo buildings, or has been until the recent uh, trickle down in prices. Okay, so should we then be trying to prevent uh, the, the the building of condos, or do we want to encourage the building of rental uh, purpose built? Buildings. I got to say, I'm skeptical of putting one's thumb on the scale in favor of one tenure or the other. One way to put it is, I think the first order problem is too many people, not enough roofs over heads. Mm -hmm. Now, people like condos to buy and they like rentals to rent. If you're lower income, of course, you prefer a rental to a condo. But 
uh, condos for owner occupancy or for investors to provide as rental units certainly provide a lot of value. And if developers are begging government and offering the government a lot of money in community amenity contributions to build condos, I say what the government ought to do is encourage the condo supply in exchange for cash take that hundred grand a unit or whatever it is and write checks to people in need. So then you've actually got take cash rather than have the property uh, developer build amenities. Uh, oh, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I mean, the amount of money at stake is so large, you couldn't build enough amenities. If in the greater Vancouver area, I think we've discussed this, if there's a million units that could be built over the next 20 years uh, that are selling at a million dollars over construction cost, rough numbers, you're looking at a trillion dollars in value that governments can unlock with allowing greater density. So there's so much money at stake. Nobody likes bike lanes better than I do, uh, but I don't think we want to spend a trillion dollars on bike lanes. I think you solve a lot of the housing affordability by number one, getting the market units built, and number two, taking the cash that developers are willing to pay for the right to add density and write checks to people in need. So are you saying then that the government should take that money and then invest it itself in the development of rental housing and become the landlord? I don't think that's the best way to go. I'd say if somebody... No, I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of people you who know, wouldn't agree with that. House, house, uh, uh, housing affordability as a problem says... Housing prices are too high for how much money I have. Now, you can say, whoops, we're going to delete market pricing and we're going to create special buildings that are off market and we'll hold lotteries where some very lucky people are going to get way below market pricing, but everybody else gets nothing. Mm -hmm. That's one approach. You can have a lottery for units that the government builds. Another approach is to say everybody who's eligible for that lottery is going to get an equal prize. They're going to get a check. And instead of this being a government-built building, this is going to be a market-built building where you can take your checks and put them. And if you can't afford new, you go out into the suburbs and you buy uh, or rent used. So in essence, give them a, uh, a renter's uh, grant or subsidy, which the current uh, provincial government has been toying with that idea. Well, well, if you like, there could be a you live in British Columbia housing allowance that the government funds out of community amenity contributions. The province, you know, really has to bless CACs as uh, it, they're not particularly allowed, as I understand provincially, municipalities uh, play a game. I think the province ought to give their explicit blessing, but say, you know, you can use some of the money, but some of it's got to get kicked upstairs for affordable housing. Cities like Vancouver want to use the money for affordable housing anyway. It, and that's really maybe second order, maybe third order, is once you have the money. If our worst problem is you have a bunch of money to spend on affordable housing, if the worst problem you have is how do we spend that affordability money, you know, mm -hmm. I think we should be pretty happy. The most important thing, though, is how do we uh, 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 generate that, that greater supply? So uh, Sam Sullivan, who is the liberal housing critic, says, look, we've got to, we have to densify. And I think that he is in, in harmony with you on that topic, isn't he? Oh, yeah, I think very highly of Sam. I mean, he's a free market, pro-environmental, so, uh, socially liberal, fiscally conservative. I think that's exactly uh, what you ought to have in a right of center party. And, and another way to think about market mechanisms, again, is I think to clarify how you ought to sell density. Because some people worry when these municipalities say, oh, sure, we'll upzone for you, but you got to give us money. Mm -hmm. You worry that a deal that's kind of marginal without those charges doesn't get built with the charges, and you don't get that kind of environmentally friendly pro-affordability density. So I I think the right way to think about selling density is a market mechanism for municipalities to say, we have a resource, and that resource is the really crazy zoning we've managed to implement through the years. It's a resource because now we get the right to sell density. But if you sell it in a transparent way and say, here's how much we want built this year, we're going to let the market say what the price is. Here's a thousand units market. You tell us what you're willing to pay. We're going to take the thousand highest uh, bids, and those will be the thousand units that get built. So you predefine exactly what housing types you're going to allow where. You uh, let the market uh, provide bids in a, something like an auction. And then it's clear. If you target a certain number of units to be built, it's up to the market to decide what's that, what that's worth. And then you can see that that sale of density isn't going to discourage uh, density because you, you're targeting a density level. Is there value in tying that uh, zoning to transportation? So if we're going to build you know, a line out to UBC, do we then say at each stop along the way, we are going to densify around that, we're going to change the zoning that comes with that, but 
Bob Lee, uh, uh, who, who we thank very much for his help for solder. Uh, but he's he's brilliant in the way that he thinks about how do you fund these things. He's saying, well, if you're going to densify there, then put into that, uh, you know, the the zoning and the permitting. The fees that are going to cover your transportation infrastructure costs. Well, one way to think about it is suppose you have the zoning we have today. Suppose you got lousy single family zoning near a lot of SkyTrain stations, which is correct, near current oh, SkyTrain right. stations <laughs> and near putative ones uh, in the future. Uh, you don't have to do much. If we say we're willing to allow uh, a few thousand condos to be built in single-family neighborhoods this year, like I suggested, the market will figure out where to build them. The market will build them in the most valuable places. And if you take bids, uh, it's going to be the best locations that offer the highest price in terms of willingness to pay to build above current density. Now, a another way to go, of course, is for the city not to, uh, to actually buy land before they tell the market where the sky train's going, then they own the land and they actually just sell sell directly. But selling zoning is not very different from selling land. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of solutions out there. We take a look at what they did in Seattle. You know, yep. Seattle had for the longest time a uh, density or not a density, sorry, a vacancy rate that was very similar to Vancouver, and now it's up to somewhere between 20 and 24 percent, and and rents are dropping. They basically built. Uh, more units than they had in the uh, in the last two or three years than they had in the previous 50 years. Do we need to take an aggressive strategy similar to theirs? Well, you know, we have. We have a lot of units under construction. I would just yeah. emphasize that. They haven't been completed yet, but starting, I don't know, 16, 17, a lot of projects get started, got started. Mm -hmm. They're condos. I think a lot of them are ultimately going to be rented out. Uh, so we do have a lot of supply coming, and I think continuing to add density works uh, in the short run. In the long run, cities are open. Vancouver's a great place. If Vancouver's beautiful and well-governed, uh, 50 years from now, it's going to be really expensive no matter how much we build. But for the current generation, new supply doesn't get absorbed that quickly, and we can make a difference. You know, New York, uh, the outer boroughs, Brooklyn and Queens got very hot as rental markets. Rents were really escalating quickly. They built a lot, and it seems to be dampening rents. Why is it important? Let's just uh, finish sure. off with why is it important that we have affordable rental housing? What does it mean to us as a community? And what does it mean to our economy? Because I think that this is a really important point to, to realize that if we want to uh, maintain this city, the culture and the economy, we have to make it a, an affordable place for people to live. Well, it depends on who you are. If you're a uh, aging homeowner looking to enjoy a, a retirement in the city that you've loved for many years, and uh, you, your kids already own a home or your kids live somewhere else, you're probably just as well off keeping the low density that's here. And of course, a lot of voters in the last elections uh, municipally indicated their support for such a, an approach. And I don't think that was irrational on their part. Right. If you're a young person <laughs> who does not own property and you want to live in this community, that you love, but you're depressed by the high prices and rents, then more supply is going to mean uh, the developers and eventually the investors that own the property are going to have more competition and you'll be uh, facing lower rents or lower prices when you buy and you're better off. If you're a firm, you know, we hear all kinds of firms uh, complaining about the difficulty in finding labor. Eventually, you're either going to have to raise wages or close shop if uh, nobody talented and young uh, is willing to live here. And it's not just young. You know, I, I asked a realtor how many people uh, in their mid 40s like me uh, come here to take executive jobs that you sort of serve as a uh, realtor. And the guy told me none. It just doesn't happen. People don't, come, don't here. come here from somewhere else unless, you know, it's New York or L.A. or something. They just don't have the equity to live comfortably. Well, and we don't have the job market that's going to support that level of uh, skill and talent that is in demand in other top cities around the world. Well, the potential is certainly here. I don't know if you saw a chart somebody recently put out with uh, graphing on the x-axis, somehow the talent of the labor force, and on the y-axis, the vertical axis was wages within the tech sector, mm -hmm. and Vancouver has an extremely talented workforce, and the wages are very low. Mm -hmm. That should be true in a way. Uh, because uh, it's such a nice place to be. People are going to tolerate higher rents and lower wages. But there is a limit, and I think firms are recognizing, you know, we're getting close. It's hard to find talent. I, I was in Calgary a couple of weeks ago talking to a fellow who heads up a, like a 
large construction firm that is international in nature. And they said in Vancouver, it is the one market where their starting salary for a graduate, a graduating engineer isn't enough. Everywhere else in the, in the rest of North America, it's fine. In Vancouver, it's not enough. And so they're saying this is causing us a problem. And small business owners are saying, well, how on earth do I attract the talent that I need if the people that I want to hire can't afford to live close to where they work. You know, small businesses, in a way, face a double whammy. One, like you say, finding talent that wants to schlep in from the suburbs uh, or take uh, the high prices to, to get a job near them. They have that problem of the labor force, scarcity or high w wages, and they're getting killed on property taxes right. because the potential residential density above their shops uh, is getting passed through to them by their landlords uh, in the form of high property taxes. You're taxed at a high commercial rate on very high residential values, and the high residential values come from an imbalance uh, between people want to be here and there's not enough supply. Right. So we, you know, it, I think that it comes back to the point that it, it, I think it's very important that we have affordable rental housing in the city uh, for a whole host of reasons. I, you know, I agree. It, it does depend on one's perspective, but I think uh, allowing people who want to make a living in this great city to do so, uh, that seems like something we ought to be encouraging, not discouraging. Great. Thanks for coming in and sharing this with us. No, oh, real pleasure. Thanks for your time. Yep. We'll, we'll do it again, okay? Hope so. Mm, yep. Thanks. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us. This has been Housing Matters, the Vancouver Real Estate Show. I'm Stuart McNish. I'm your host. Next time, we're going to be talking about taxes. Tune in then. Mm.